Welcome everyone to the January 2022 webinar for the California MBA's Mortgage Quality and Compliance Committee. Very happy that you can join us. I'm Susan Malazzo. I run the organization and uh, I, this is our, our kickoff event for, uh, for 22. Uh, if you have not joined us previously, we hold these on a monthly basis uh, and we highlight a uh, wide variety of compliance and quality assurance topics for the residential lending industry. Uh, if you are a member of the California MBA and would like to be a part of the committee that helps us um, decide on topics and speakers, um, please contact us and we'll be happy to get you involved uh, with, um, with our committee going forward. Whoops, sorry about that. Um, one thing before we get started, I want to let everybody know that we still do have a sponsorship opportunity available for the MQAC webinars. Um, if your company sponsors this year, your, um, your logo will go onto all of our digital marketing through email and on social media. And at the start of each of our webinars, we'll allow you to do a 30 second commercial talking about a compliance topic, maybe a tip, and a little bit about your company. So if you are interested in that opportunity, contact us at sponsor at cmba.com. Um, with that, I'm very happy to uh, announce a new team member at the California MBA. Uh, Samantha Gallagher has joined us as our member engagement director, and she will be working with uh, all of our committees um, helping execute our, our webinars, podcasts, and if you are a member of the California MBA or interested in becoming a member, you can reach out to Sam and she'll share with you all of the benefits of membership. So Sam, welcome. We're very happy to have you on board. Uh, also, I'd like to introduce our leadership for the Mortgage Quality and Compliance Committee this year. Uh, we have Paula Lieber with CMG Financial and Michael Steer with MQMR. So Paula, I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much. And Susan, it looks like the slides didn't progress. Oops. Uh, hang on. Uh, while she's working on that, oh, there we are. Thank you. Um, yes, please, if you um, can sponsor, we would love to have you guys sponsor. Um, Michael and I are very happy to be the chairs this year. Um, we're excited and working on topics to help all of you and us included for this year. Um, topics like today's is very important. Very important for me. I was very excited that we could have these folks on to help us understand what we need to do. So uh, if you have any topics or anything that you would like us uh, to have a webinar on, please let us know. We'd be happy to work on that, um, find speakers. Um, we, we just want to make these uh, beneficial for everyone. Uh, first, we will start with our legislative update. Um, Pat, if you could go ahead and take away. Thank you. Um, just want to start actually before we talk about bills, let you know where we're at in the legislative process. The legislature just came back earlier this month from their um, fall essential uh, adjournment. And so we're going to see a lot of activity coming up in the next month. Um, basically, they have to introduce all of their bills um, towards the end of uh, February. So we're going to see a few thousand bills introduced in the next month and a half or so. Um, what uh, I want to talk about today are a few of the bills that I think are notable. Um, uh, a couple of them were introduced last year, AB 13, which we did oppose, and this would have created um, uh, new requirements for anybody that uses automated decision systems. So, you know, something as uh, basic as underwriting, any, you know, basic software that's automated in any form. You'd have to review it and um, determine if there are any discriminatory impact on protected classes and then provide the report analysis to the Department of Financial Protection, Innovation, et cetera. The bill um, was held in the Appropriations Committee. It had an opportunity to come up in January. It was not brought up due to the opposition. So the bill is officially dead. So that's good news. I will say we'll likely see some other bill on automated decision type systems uh, issues come up again, but for now, um, uh, this bill, this issue is dead. Next bill I want to talk about is AB 1093, um, remote online notarization. This is uh, an issue that we've been working on for several years now. 
Um, this bill would uh, put in place the ability to utilize remote online notarization in California. Um, it did pass out of the Assembly Judiciary Committee and out of the Appropriations Committee. Um, it is now on the Assembly floor. We expect it to come up uh, as early as tomorrow. It, it um, has to pass out of the Assembly by the end of January. Um, there is still some controversy on this bill. The amendments that were taken in Assembly Judiciary Committee do have some, there are some concerns with these amendments. One, it does create a private right of action for the um, RON platforms. So that's uh, an issue of concern. And then also, it does not allow for interstate recognition um, for RON notarization. So essentially, um, you would be able to have interstate recognition for uh, the old school uh, notarization, paper notarizations, but for remote online notarization, um, essentially, you would only be able to use California notaries. So that's an issue of concern. Um, we have let the author know that these are two issues that we still want to work on. But at the moment, um, you know, we think it's better to let this issue continue to move and then see if we can fix it uh, because it's been uh, such a long term project. Um, that's it as far as issues that I wanted to uh, talk about today. Pat, did you want to um, mention that we will be seeing some sort of... Um... Oh, I apologize. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Yeah. Um, bill that has not been introduced yet, um, but we got, received notification from the chair of the Senate Banking Committee that she was planning on introducing uh, a bill to deal with uh, the state community reinvestment, um, essentially create a state uh, community reinvestment act. Um, it would apply to... Residential Mortgage Lending Act um, uh, licensees, so non-depositories. Um, it would apply to state chartered banks. It would apply to state chartered credit unions, and it would apply to money transmitters. Uh, essentially, creating new requirements at the state level for these entities with respect to CRA, um, putting in an examination regimen and rating system, depending on the results of the examination, and it would um, allow for up to a hundred thousand dollar penalty for um, you know extreme violations of of the new act we will be sending out the um, the legislation once it's in formal form but um, obviously this is going to be an issue of great concern to uh, the independent mortgage banks in california thank you so much that's a great update Really appreciate that. Um, we now will move on to our presentation. Uh, this is definitely very important for all of us that service loans in California. We're very excited that you guys were able to join us for our very first webinar for the year so we can know what to do and make sure we do it um, immediately. Uh, first, I'll introduce our speakers. We have Brian Courtney. He is with CalHAFA, the California Housing Finance Agency. He's been there for about six months. But he's been in the mortgage industry for 26 years and specifically in servicing since wonderful 2007. So he's seen it all. And he is the mortgage servicer liaison. Um, and he's here to help us with all of our questions um, and has a great presentation for us. And then we will also hear from Marianne Smith. She has been with the California Department of Financial Protection and Innovation since 2004 and has served as the deputy commissioner since 2012. She leads a team of attorneys, examiners, and investigators to protect our consumers through policy development and uh, the creation of education materials and litigation. We are very excited to have both of you on today. Um, and please, Brian, take it away. Super, thanks so much, Paul, appreciate it. Um, I wanna call out something real quick on our first slide, it says counselor training. I know not all of you guys are counselors, but what we really strive for in this program is education above all. So this is a deck that we actually use to, to share with the HUD counselors and any other individuals that may be uh, you know, going out and talking to the public about our program. So we'll use this and kind of go through the, the highlights of the program. If you would go ahead and change the next screen. And go ahead and skip the welcome. All right, and uh, basically what we're doing here is reviewing the structure of our, our, our program and the mechanics of the homeowner process. 
Um, I want to call out that California is the largest state for uh, funds received. We are, are in receipt of $1 billion in federal mortgage relief funds, and that will be administered by Cal HFA Homeowner Relief Corporation. Um, and this deck, again, is just a tool that we use, one of the many that we're using for our homeowners to get educated about our process. Go ahead. Some of the agenda items we'll cover is our, our program itself, the use of the program funds, eligibility requirements, the actual application process, uh, community and faith-based organizations, housing counseling, frauds and scams that we wanna be aware of, and then lastly, we'll take questions. Go ahead. <clears throat> the purpose of the program was designed to provide a streamlined assistance to fully reinstate delinquent first mortgages and reverse mortgage arrears for homeowners negatively impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. That's what started the whole ball of wax, and this is what we're really trying to help folks get out from underneath of. It helps avoid preventable foreclosures and displacement of homeowners, so that and ideally designed for those with no other loss mitigation options, um, and, and gets them into a, a scenario where they're, they're now able to work forward as opposed to trying to dig out from the hole. And in addition to that, and this is the piece we talk a lot about, is connecting our homeowners to housing counseling services. And that allows them to foster not only a long-term solution for that consumer, but it also helps build you know, rapport within that agency that's, that's having the conversation. Go ahead. Our program funds are provided in the form of a one-time grant. The money does not have to be repaid. We're not requiring the borrower to stay in the home for an extended period of time. We're not saying that we're gonna give you six payments. Literally, we are taking a borrower from its from their delinquency cycle, whatever the total amount is up to our max, and we are paying that to bring them current. So they start fresh from day one. We make our payment directly to the mortgage servicer, and then the servicer applies the money to the delinquent account. <clears throat> Funds can cover things like principal, interest, taxes, insurance, any escrow shortages that may, may be out there that are needed to fully, anything basically needed to fully reinstate the mortgage to a current status. <clears throat> Loans that do not have an escrow account, um, let's say for example, the borrower is delinquent and they had waived escrows in the past, we're asking them to establish escrows with their servicers so that we can then in fact pay the servicer and get their escrows brought current. The one thing we're asking our servicers to do is late fees and NS, NSF fees, post 121 of 2020 we'd ask them to waive that and the reason being is that those are covid related uh scenario and that's where our program starts anything prior to that is up to them to waive most of our servicers are waiving that that entirely if we had somebody that was a december or a, a november go ahead basic high level requirements and and i i say high level because we're going to touch upon a lot of things that are going to create more questions, I'm sure of it. And there's a, a million nuances and we, and we don't have enough time in the day really to cover everything, but you'll get the gist of everything that we're, we're offering for our program. The borrower must be at least two mortgage payments delinquent as of the launch of this program, okay? <clears throat> our program launched December 27th. That means they have to be delinquent prior to no, November 1st of 2021, okay? They have to have experienced a qualified financial hardship after January 21 of 2020. They must currently own and occupy the property in California as their primary residence. Not own and occupy more than one property. And they have to provide all the necessary documentation to satisfy our program guidelines. And our documentation is really pretty simple. We're asking for pay stubs. We're asking for bank statements. We're asking for a utility bill or something to validate they live in the property. And then along with that, a mortgage statement. It's, it, and there could be some other things that, that pop in based on what we identify with the borrower, but those are our four basic things that we require, okay? <clears throat> Additional re requirements from the eligibility side. If the property was in foreclosure, we're asking the servicers that uh, the property, um, the foreclosure must not have been completed. So we're asking them to put it on hold. That's a big one. Uh, in fact, we're dealing with one right now that was scheduled to go to foreclosure sale on the 27th. We just got the servicer set up, I think, the middle of uh, middle of January. So we've asked them to put it on hold. We we have reviewed the borrower and they are eligible 
and we're working to get them finalized and get it taken care of. So that was a good one we saved. Um, active bankruptcy home, homeowners are eligible with the trustee approval. As you may know, the, obviously, if I file a bankruptcy, the trustee owns all the assets in the in the uh, the bankruptcy, and we just need to make sure we can apply funds to that. In these situations, we're asking the borrower or the borrower's attorney to uh, get trustee approval, as the mortgage servicer, since they are debt, debt collector, cannot reach out and ask that. Um, the original loan amount of the first mortgage cannot be greater than the conforming loan limit at the time of origination. That's a big one. We actually have ran a table all the way back. I believe the table goes back to like 1994, um, which should encompass, I think we've had two mortgages that were actually originated prior to 1994. But other than that, we've pretty much covered every, every mortgage that we can. Co-owners are not permitted to separately apply for, apply for grants. Uh, in other words, the husband can't apply and the wife can't apply and then they get double dipped. Um, it, this is a, a good time to point this out. The servicer is going to tell us what the delinquency amount is. Once we establish what that delinquency amount is and we've reviewed the consumer, we're actually going to pay, as we stated before, we're gonna pay the servicer. The servicer will then apply the funds, but if the loan is current, they will send the funds back to the state and allow us to use those funds for somebody else. Okay, go ahead. The two types of financial hardships that uh, we deem eligible are obviously reduction in income, whether it be temporary or permanent loss of income directly uh, relate or indirectly related to coronavirus pandemic after January 21 of 2020, includes things like layoffs, hours of work, loss of customers, business closures, maybe you had to change jobs, all kinds of things that, that could happen in this scenario, companies shutting down, et cetera. Those are all things that would be considered uh, an viable hardship or make them eligible or an increase in living expenses temporary or permanent increase in out-of-pocket household expenses such as medical um, maybe they had a, a large utility bill maybe they had a hot water heater bust or a furnace that had to be replaced or things like that that caused uh, a difficult situation we understand that too go ahead our income eligibility requirements <laughs> Here's where the meat, the rubber meets the road, so to speak. So our right now, our program is set up to drive towards, um, you know, disparate homeowners and people that are are really struggling to make ends meet. So our household income must be equal to or less than 100% of the area median income in the county, where that residence is located at. So we actually have a table, and it's a time-driven table based on on everything we need. It says, here's what the area median income is for that county. We take the entire household, whether they're on the mortgage or not, anybody over the age of 18, the entire household, we look at their income and do they meet or are below the area median income? If they are, then we can process to the next step. If they're above the area median income, then we would actually deny them right now. Now, downrange, we may adjust this. Let me go back, if we could go back real quick. One of the things I want to call out, though, is we we may or may not adjust our 100%. If we see that we get a lot of folks that are at 125, 115, we've had, in our our plan that we submitted, we have that flexibility to increase that percentage if necessary. Okay, go ahead. <clears throat> income eligibility um, greater than 40% housing to income ratio. So this one we look at just the individuals that are on the mortgage. And we say, here's their income. We divide it into what their mortgage payment is. If their income is, or if the ratio ends up being 40% or greater, um, then we ask them to seek, uh, I'm sorry, 40% or greater, we actually will process them through our, our system and take them to the next step to see if they qualify. If it is 40% or below, um, we're asking them if they have a denial letter already from their servicer where they have applied for loss mitigation and they don't qualify, We'll go ahead and process them through. Otherwise, we're asking them to reach out to their servicer, look for opportunities to see if they may or may not qualify, as well as they can reach out to a HUD counselor who can review them and see if there's something else they can do and come back and then essentially come back into the program once they've completed that and they have the letter verifying that. Okay. We don't want to just kick them out because they're below 40, but we need to validate the reason. Oh, go back one more thing I'm going to call out on the last slide. Sorry. <clears throat> 
households that receive more than 50% of their monthly mortgage payment in public assistance, regardless of HTI, so for example, unemployment, medical, WIC, SNAP, all the things that are out there, they're automatically going to be moving forward to the next step of the program, regardless of HTI. Okay. Denial letters, we talk about a borrower must reach out to their servicer and submit the requirements needed to be reviewed for the servicer's loss mitigation workouts. A lot of times we'll have a borrower just call their servicer and say, I need you to send me a denial letter um, so that we can we can get approved for the state. And realistically, that's not the way we want to do things. If they're below 40% HTI, more than likely they will qualify with their servicer um, for a loss mitigation option. And you know, while I understand everybody wants to take this path and, and get quick and fast and easy, we really want to try and help those folks that need it the most, that, that have no other options or have a lot more difficult situation first. So we're asking them to do that. If a bar does not qualify for any of the loss mit mitigation workouts with their servicer, except for example, a deed in lieu or short sale, the servicer always sends a letter that says, hey, you didn't qualify and here's why. That letter brings them right back into the program, okay? The homeowner must request uh, an, uh, or, or may request an attestation from the housing counselor stating that an alternative workout is not an option for the homeowner. And this is if their servicer is not being very responsive to them, um, they can actually sit down with a housing counselor and go through the process, the same process with a housing counselor who should be able to look at that and validate whether or not they would qualify for lost med. Okay. Income eligibility requirements. Okay. Um, so I am a HUD certified housing counselor I've worked with, and this is an example of the letter that the counselor would be sending back to us, identifying that they have sat down with Mr. and Mrs. Smith or whoever they may be, and they've reviewed everything and they've identified it. They'll send this letter back into us and we'll process them to the next step of the, of the program. All right, go ahead. Property eligibility requirements. This is a big one because we see everything. <laughs> Actually, I'm going to be honest with you, there's stuff I've never seen, and I see it now. Um, so our program requires that the property be single family, attached or detached home, condominium, one unit, owner occupied, manufacturing housing, as long as it's affixed, and it becomes real property at that point, right? So they have a deed and a mortgage on it. If they don't have a deed, then they have a title. If they have a title, it's considered chattel, and it's not considered part of the program. Um, not eligible would be second homes, investment properties, or vacant or abandoned properties where people try to go back into it and they've abandoned the property already. So we, we see some pretty unique stuff and I'll, I'll share with you, uh, one of the other things we see a lot of is um, a trust loan that comes through or a, I, I'm gonna loan money to you type scenario and here's my contract and and now you're behind. So we see those kinds of things also, but. The key here is we've got to have an entity that's registered with the state to be able to hand the funds over to them. That's part of our fraud. And we'll talk about that a little more down the road. Go ahead. Next slide. <clears throat> okay, applications. All homeowners must apply via the California Mortgage Relief Program website. That's the camortgagerelief.org. Um, they, they complete a brief questionnaire and that gives them the ability to, to determine if they're eligible. And some of the baselines would be, for example, if they're over $80,000 in delinquency, they're not gonna be eligible right now. If they are, uh, you know, own multiple homes, they would not be eligible right now. Um, if they were, you know, in a scenario, let's say it was a trailer and it was not permanently affixed, they would not be eligible. So those are some things that they'll find out just from the questionnaire. It saves them time so they don't waste, you know, a couple, maybe 30 or 40 minutes going through the whole application process, uploading docs only to find out later that they don't qualify. <clears throat> if they're eligible, the application, uh, the applicant can begin the application by creating a user profile. And then what they do is they go in, they start entering their information, you know, the property address, who their mortgage servicer is, um, their delinquency, the number of people in the home, all the things that we would need to be able to, to decide the process. Um, gets put in the application. It takes about 35 to 40 minutes to go through the whole thing. Um, and we offer them the opportunity to sit with HUD counselors and go through it or other individuals. But at the end of the day, they're the ones who have to sign it and acknowledge through attestations that they agree to everything that's in there. Okay, go ahead. Um, and this is kind of what I was talking about. The applicant 
should we always tell them before they get started go ahead and get those four things we talked about your mortgage statement your proof of income or any other kind of subsidy you might be receiving and then your proof of residency which would be that utility bill there's one more thing that's not on here that i mentioned earlier and that's their mortgage statement it's kind of important for us to know who your mortgage servicer is so we would ask them to upload that also and then go ahead and choose their their name and put in the loan number so that we have that information okay good next slide <clears throat> all right cbo's are going to be uh, on these it's community-based organizations and in here what we're trying to target is um, religious organizations or other groups that are neighborhood uh, efficient groups that have communication with the consumer so that they are able to act similar similar to a housing counselor or maybe um, you know somebody that that individual trusts within their community and coach them or guide them through this process um, we strongly encourage this as well as the um, housing counselor as a as a local source for that borrower you know they don't know brian courtney they don't know anybody on the the cow hfa uh, program so they may know somebody in their neighborhood that's a a a leader form uh, individual who could definitely help them or help them understand some things so we really try to push that in educational piece onto the consumer okay <clears throat> type of assistance the applicants may need um, they may help may need help and this goes to what the housing counselor can do or the cbo they may need just general help with the application prep or even submitting i know there's a lot of folks that aren't familiar with how to scan stuff like I just learned uh, maybe five or six months ago that I could scan a, a complete document with my cell phone using the notepad feature and upload it. And I didn't realize that. But those are things that, you know, people, and I like to think I'm tech savvy, but I'm learning every day. There's more I don't know. But there are people who don't even understand how to scan a document or how to, to email something or whatever. And so we're asking that those, either the housing counseling or the CBOs are assisting these people with prep and or submission where needed. They're gonna work with the mortgage, uh, work with the applicant and the mortgage servicer throughout the process to help build that, um, that bond to make sure that we're getting everything that we can for the homeowner. They may even do an out the analyzation of the finances and the housing affordability. And I'm gonna pause here for a second because there's one thing I, want, I really wanna call out. That word housing affordability is very big. One of the things that we talked about when we initiated our program and why we chose to do the reinstatement versus giving someone six more payments or trying to do a modification or any of the other things that are going on was that even though they do those things, those borrowers still may not be able to afford that payment. Okay. They still may be in a situation where they're going to struggle once we bring them current. So the key here is in the coaching of what their options are are my options that I can go to my servicer and apply for an eminent default modification? Yes, that's an option they have. Is there an option that I can get income or additional job, excuse me, and start paying my mortgage? Yes, that's an option. Is there an option that I could sell my property and potentially walk away with some, in, some, some cash that allows me to sustain my family a little longer than what would happen otherwise? Yes, that is a very real option. And I think when we looked at those, those options outweighed the others and became pretty much a big light bulb turn on that ideally, if we're doing our program the right way and the people are counseling the right way and coaching the right way, they really should be able to effectively move through this process. And the, the biggest part I always preach about is if we keep somebody out of foreclosure, and they have to sell their home while they may not like that they walk away with some money and they go to a rental scenario and they survive for another year they get back on their feet they're able to go buy a home right now versus if they go to a foreclosure it's a three to five year waiting process for them to be able to apply for a mortgage again and we want to make sure that that's an opportunity that just because they had something small happen it doesn't affect their ability to buy a house downrange okay all right go ahead we have a contact center. We have a lot of folks working at contact center. Um, we are there to take phone calls and answer just about any question. Um, we provide assistance to the application through that or to the applicant um, in their application. So if they had a question about something that's on the application, they can call in. 
Um, we do multiple languages, so that's a big plus. Um, our contact center will refer applicants to HUD certified counselors if they need that. Um, we really work hard to make sure that the consumer has every opportunity to understand the program, get educated through the program, and be able to work with us and, and with their servicer to get either brought current or down the right path for them. All right, go ahead, next slide. So I wanna call out some of the frauds and scams and just kind of prepare people. <clears throat> Having gone through 2007, 2008, 2009, 2010, 2011, there, there was a lot of scams that were orchestrated through um, the borrower in order for other individuals to get money. And what we really wanna to drive to the folks is that there is no cost, zero cost to apply for this program, okay? And there's no cost to get assistance from a HUD counselor. So if you're paying somebody for counseling or somebody says, yeah, I can help you, here's my fee, go ahead and give me the money and I'll take care of everything for you and get your current, that's a scam. Well, it may not be a scam, but there's no need to do that. I just wanna make sure that I'm calling this out for everybody so that their, their consumers are aware also. There is no cost at all to apply or to get approved in this program. Okay, go ahead. And here's some of the examples they'll say. There's a house, they'll, they'll pick up the phone and go, I'm a housing counselor, or I'm a lawyer, or I represent a law firm, and I'm from the government. Um, they'll handle all kinds of details of a deal. They, I can get your mortgage lowered. I can get your, they'll basically regurgitate everything that's in our program to the consumer. So it sounds like they're the ones actually, actually doing it. And then they'll dissuade the consumer from contacting the lender or a real lawyer or a real housing counselor, because then they'll find out that this is a fraud. Um, they'll have borrowers sometimes make mortgage payments directly to them, which we all know that's not gonna get applied to the mortgage. So that's just another way that continues to happen. So, all right, go ahead, next slide. Some of the red flags that we, we strongly ask people to be aware of is um, if you're giving personal identifiable information to an unknown source. Um, so be aware of unsolicited robocalls in, in specific. They're coming in phone call now and in text. Do not send money in cash or gift cards or money orders or wire transfers. <clears throat> Obviously, that uh, they may receive suspicious official notices. Um, to do everything quickly or being asked to act now, if they're pushing that consumer, like hurry up, hurry up, hurry up, usually that's a sign uh, of a red flag and they need to be aware of what's really happening to them. All right, go ahead, next slide. I'm gonna pause and then open up for any questions or any comments or conversation. Uh, you know, uh, thank you, Brian. That was uh, great information. Really appreciate that. Um, if any of our participants have a question, you can pose those in the questions dialog box um, on your menu bar. We will take all questions at the conclusion of the presentation uh, oh, from everyone. So, uh, Brian, thank you so much for, um, for that great information. Um, no, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Well, we are going to um, move on to uh, Marianne Smith, who joins us from the Department of Financial Protection and Innovation. Uh, Marianne, take it away. Good morning, everyone. My name is Marianne Smith. I'm the Deputy Commissioner of the Enforcement Division at the Department of Financial Protection and Innovation. Go ahead, next slide. I'm going to talk to you today briefly about an initiative that we did uh, late last year where we called upon, many of you probably are aware of it, we um, called on our mortgage servicer licensees to respond to a report so that we could um, ensure that they are prepared for complying with the laws and um, identifying homeowners that can go into these programs like Brian was discussing and uh, whether they have increased staffing, um, making sure their policies and procedures are um, in effect. Go ahead, next slide. So we, we thank you so much. We had 100% participation of our mortgage servicer licensees. 100% of them responded to the report and our analysis of the report um, and our servicers are uh, our servicers manage 4.6 million mortgage loans 
and that amounts to about 1.4 trillion dollars go ahead next slide so what we found after we reviewed all of the reports and crunched all the numbers and analyzed all the data was that 86% of our licensees had the appropriate policies and procedures in place to protect homeowners and to comply with all of the um, new laws regarding forbearances. And 72% had actually added sufficient staffing to, um, to help with these new laws, to help with compliance, and to help home, homeowners avoid foreclosure. Next slide. The commissioner, we had a press release on January 5th and the commissioner announced and wanted to thank all of the licensees who have signed up um, for this program and who responded and um, thank them all for responding to our report so that we could ensure that you're ready, able and willing to, to um, comply with these laws and help direct homeowners to this program and invited those that haven't signed up yet or enrolled in the Cal HFA program to please do so. Next slide. So participation in Brian's program from our licensees has been steady. We continue to work with our licensees and um, contact them. Those that, are, those that have at least one borrower application pending, we are contacting them and encouraging them to quickly complete the onboarding process so that uh, the Californians that are in need of this mortgage relief get access because the uh, borrowers can only get the funds if the servicers are signed up and enrolled in the program. So we uh, find it very important that we um, let all of our licensees know that the borrowers can't get the money if they don't enroll. So that's why we're calling them and encouraging them to please sign up as soon as they can. Next slide. So thank you. I just want to, um, you know, like Brian mentioned at the beginning of his presentation last week, we did have a, uh, a servicer licensee who um, put a foreclosure sale up for, for this week, and the borrower had in fact applied for the Cal HFA program, but the servicer had not yet fully enrolled in the program. So the borrower wasn't able to get the money, but yet the foreclosure sale was set. So we, um, we all quickly acted and contacted the servicer, make sure, made sure they were aware of this, that they need to get on board right away so and to uh, delay the foreclosure which they did it is our goal that no foreclosures and we ask that you help us in um, that there should be no foreclosures of borrowers who have applications pending with this program um, and are waiting for the servicer to enroll so thank you and I welcome any questions as well. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne. We uh, really appreciate you being uh, part of today's webinar. Um, again, if you have any questions, and I see a couple of questions that have been posed in the box uh, dialog box, you're welcome to post those in the, the Q&A box on your menu bar. Um, before we get to that, I just want to thank uh, Marianne and the DFPI for um, executing that servicer survey. We worked very closely with the department to encourage um, our members and the industry to respond, but it's important for the industry to understand the kind of the purpose behind that. One of the purposes behind it was to allow the industry to give our, um, to, to share how prepared we were to handle those borrowers that are exiting forbearance. And I think that the regulator in California offered us an opportunity to share that information with, uh, with policymakers uh, before they felt it necessary to maybe um, institute some sort of legislation that might, um, you know, might Im impede our opportunities or ability to help borrowers. So thank you DFPI for, um, for allowing us to share all the good work that the industry is doing. Um, so I'm going to go to the questions that are. Listen, uh, can I actually ask a question? I have some for Brian. So for what we need to do 
you know, I, I'm a sub I have a subservicer, but I am the master servicer and I need to make sure that I'm monitoring my subservicer. That's that's my responsibility. Um, I think it's really important that we all know that we need to sign up. It is not solely our subservicer. And um, that was something that you were able to make sure that I understood. And I think that's very important that we all know that we need to go in and we can refer the files to our subservicer. If you can just give us a little bit of information on that. Oh, you're on mute. Yep, absolutely, Paul, I sure can, thank you. Uh, a great question, and I, I deal with this question 15 times a day, if not more. So if you are a servicer of loans, you originate them or you buy them and you or take care of them in that realm, and the mortgage statement that goes out has your company's name on it, then you should be set up and dealing with it. If you are a, ser a master servicer and you have other companies that subservice your loans, the borrower usually, in most cases, sees your name on the mortgage statement. They don't know about your subservicing entity in most cases. So what happens is they apply for the, the program. They're going to put your name in the, more, in the application. They're going to put your loan number or the loan number in there. And then we're going to go sending it to you, to who, I guess is the question, right? And, and we don't have a way of knowing who that loan belongs to because we have multiple master servicers that subservice with multiple subservicers. So if that's the case, what we do is we send a, you have to be set up as a master. We will send you a file. You look at it. You tell us who is subservice with, you're literally going to change two fields in the in the Excel document. One is the, the file type. You're going to put an O in it. And then the other is going to say, this loan is subservice with XYZ. We take it back. We run it through the process and it goes over to XYZ now. The big, re the big reason you need to be set up is because the ultimate, our agreement says that you're responsible for that loan and you're going to ensure that that loan is brought current if they are approved and gone through the program. You as the master servicer own that that loan, so you're responsible to ensure that your subservicer does that, okay? I do not need a bank attestation from you unless you're receiving funds. If you're receiving funds, then I will need that. But other than that, I need you to be set up from the servicer agreement side of the fence, and then I need you to be set up on the CDF side of the fence. And we will host the SFTP site. It's literally a lot easier if you do that but we will host it. Then you literally go out, you'll get an email when there's a, a, a file out there. It tells you, hey, I've got a record I need to look at. You go look at the record, you make the changes, upload it back, and you're done with it. And, and I would caution each master servicer to just kind of store that data somewhere so they can track and make sure with their subservicer what the statuses are. Great question, Paul. Yeah, thank you, Paula. That's very important for uh, for all lenders to uh, to make sure that they're that they're aware of. Um, a few questions here. First of all, let everybody know we are recording today's webinar, and it will be available on both on our YouTube channel and on our website. So if you want to revisit the content provided today or um, share it with a colleague we will make that recording available to you. Um, I think we answered this question, but I'm gonna put it out there. How much is the maximum grant, Brian? The maximum right now is $80,000. I will I will tell you, we will go beyond that on this circumstance right now only. And let's say that we have a consumer who applies today and their delinquency amount is 77,500, let's say. And that's their total delinquency, but their servicer is not set up with us yet. And we're going to be pushing to get those servicers set up. And I, I want to give huge kudos to Marianne and her staff because they've helped us immensely with getting that done. But um, once, let's say there's a delay in getting their servicer set up, and now that borrower rolls over the $80,000, we will look to make an exception on that case. But our, our ceiling otherwise is $80,000. Okay, great. Um, would a borrower who qualifies on all other requirements, is current on the first loan, has a matured second loan in foreclosure, qualify for a total payoff of the second? Unfortunately, no. The The reason being, um, if that second lien wanted to foreclose, they would have to pay off the first, and more than likely, they would not do that. But again, I can't speak for the second lien. That's you know up to them. But our program is designed solely for first liens only. I'm not sure we have the answer to this. Somebody asked, how can a nonprofit get certified as a housing counselor to assist 
with this. Do you do that through HUD? I actually know that. <laughs> oh, okay, perfect. Awesome. Um, yeah, they would need to reach out to HUD um, and go through the process to be a HUD certified. Um, but we also, they may also fall into the CBO side. Um, so if that's the case, if they're a neighborhood counseling agency, what I would do is I would ask them to call into the call center number and they'll get put in touch with someone from the state who will drive them to the CBO side. Uh, Brian, how long does the application process take for an app? I think one, I think the question is once somebody has applied, about how long are you anticipating that process to take? To I can give you the window pretty, pretty good. So a borrower usually takes about 40 minutes to an hour, let's say worst case, as long as they include all the documentation at the original application and we don't have to go back and, and request additional stuff. So in, in the utopia, oh, I'm sorry. I think what they're asking is once it's in, how yep, long does it I'm, take yep. on your side? I got you, I'll go through the whole thing. So okay, an hour for the borrower to get it in, then we, we actually take it from there. Once we've identified we have everything and that servicer is set up, we'll create what's called the eye record. That gets sent out to the servicer usually the next day. So within 24 to 48 hours, barring a weekend, um, it'll be in the, the servicer's uh, bin to respond. Servicers are taking anywhere from three to 10 days to get that information back to us, depending on the delinquency of that loan. If that loan is in foreclosure, one of the things they have to do is close and bill to get information from their vendors to find out what the total amount due is. That now comes back into our world as a what's called a V record or verification record. It usually gets reviewed within three to five days. At that point, once it's reviewed and let's say it's approved, from the time that the, it's been approved, that following Tuesday, the funds are drafted to be sent out on that following Thursday. So realistically, the whole process in the utopian world should take less than 30 days. Excellent, okay. Uh, and we do are doing, and, and to top on that, we are doing delinquency plus one. Okay, um, other than waiving fees and putting foreclosures on hold, are there other regulations or guidelines that the servicer must comply with as a participant in the program? There is, and, and I didn't mention this earlier, but it's a great question and thanks for asking it. The one thing that we really want to make sure of is that that borrower gets taken care of, period. So if they're going through your loss mitigation process, they can do that at the same time they're applying for our program. One of two things need to happen. If you approve that borrower, let's say for a modification or a partial claim or some workout that, and the intent of that workout is to bring the borrower current, and they've accepted that, then you need to send us a what's called an O record, which means, hey, they're done, they don't want it, we're done, thanks so much, have a good day, and you'll take it from your side. Likewise, if we are working that borrower and we send you what's called an A record, which means they're approved and we're done, we're getting ready to issue funds, then what we ask the servicer to do is to reach out to that consumer and validate that they want our, our funds and they don't want to proceed with their loss mitigation workout. Okay, all right, great, thank you. Um, when a borrower is given the money to reinstate the loan, uh, the question is relative to tax implications. Uh, there's a tax effect for the borrower. Is, should they have tax liability for that $80,000? So I, I'm, I'm gonna to touch this one with kid gloves. Um, I know initially when we opened the program, there was conversation around a 1099. I'd have to get back with the group and let them know whether or not 1099s are being issued. I believe that they are, but I won't promise that. And then I'm, I'm, I'm not a tax consultant, so I don't know what their liability to that would be. And so one, uh, okay, that, that's a fair question. And if, as we learn more about that, we can we can share that so our servicers know what to share with the borrowers as well. Right, Susan, uh, I'll let you know probably in the next day or two so you can have that for your information. That would be, that would be great, thank you. Um, you talked about the 30 days to get the approval of the grant, but then how long after that to do the, the funding of the grant? Oh, that's Time. that's from start to finish. You will be oh, start started. to finish. So yeah. it's 30 days inclusive. Awesome. All right. Thank yeah. you. Um, do you do you advise the servicer in writing if the borrower is approved or declined? So we all the communication back and forth to the servicer is done through what's called a CDF record or a common data file. So as soon as that borrower has been approved from us, the state, they'll receive what's called an A record CDF. And that tells them that that borrower has been approved. Now, 
having been in servicing long enough, I know that most servicers are probably using HHF people to handle the uh, HAF funds. And that's a different department than the loss mitigation department. So what I would counsel servicers to do is to have the HHF people have the ability to create some form of task within their system or something that notifies the loss mitigation as soon as they receive that A file. Okay. Uh, questions are still are still coming in. Uh, sure. Does the program uh, also permit high balance conforming loan limit loan amounts? So it, it all is it, it all is based around what the what the county is because each county had a different dollar amount um, for what their uh, authorized was a maximum mortgage amount would be. I mean, I've seen some, I think in like, for, for example, San Francisco, I think had 771,000 or something like that as a loan amount eligible. So, you know, obviously if it's a $4 million home that probably isn't going to qualify, but you know. Okay. Um, I think that uh, wraps up our questions for uh, for today. And Brian, Marianne, thank you so much for uh, your presentation. It was very valuable information, and we're very happy to to have you um, as part of our um, our kickoff event for the Mortgage Quality and Compliance Committee. Um, for those of you who would like to join us next month, mark your calendars on February 24th, where we uh, our topic will be "Be Your Compliance Best in 2022." We're going to feature uh, Rob Chrisman, author of the Chrisman Commentary, to kind of give an economic outlook for the industry um, for the remainder of 22. And we welcome Janice Gray Tucker from Buckley talking about the highest priorities for uh, the CFPB uh, in this year. So uh, that concludes today's webinar. Thank you all for joining, and uh, we hope to see you next month. <laughs>